Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to this, the second of our International League Against Epilepsy eFora, um, discussing uh, specific topics. In this case, the use of cannabinoids in the management of the epilepsies. And to talk today, it's not only myself, um, Helen Cross from London, but we also have um, Professor Jorgen Trinker from Austria and Professor Cecilia Lim Lund Landmark from Norway. Just as a, some housekeeping, this is, um, we do want to give you the opportunity um, to answer, ask questions. We are going to have a series of presentations, but at the end, um, ample time for you to ask questions and for us to address those. So if you have questions, please type those into the question and answer box so they can be addressed by us, by the panelists. And at the end of this e-forum, we will um, ask you to complete a short survey um, just to, to know feedback. And we'd really appreciate it if you were able to complete this for us. Next slide. Just to highlight that we do have some declarations of interest, myself um, and Eugen Trinka and Cecily Landmark as um, uh, highlighted on this slide. So to start the um, uh, proceedings, I'm going to present a case, a boy that came to us for a further opinion at the age of 11 years. His first seizure had been at the age of 10 months. This was reported by his mother to be characterized by a shrill cry followed by some chewing movements that lasted no more than 15 seconds. But they, he then had a further seizure two hours later and they steadily um, recurred and increased in frequency to around eight per nine to nine per day, ultimately recurrently occurring in clusters. The situation involved not only to in include these focal onset seizures, but also he had recurrent jerks of single jerks of limbs and more prolonged stiffening episodes, particularly from sleep. And then his stiffening episodes also began to cause him to drop to the floor by day up to 10 times per day. He trialed numerous medications in the past, including zanisamide, clobazam, sodium valparate, carbamazepine, and um, next, next, and the current medication that he was on at the time that he came to us was clobazam, sodium valparate, and indeed in a ketogenic diet. Neurodevelopmentally, he'd been reported as normal to the age of four years by his mum, but then had made slow progress since, and indeed at the age of 11, he'd had a recent diagnosis of autistic spectrum disorder. Also recently, he'd been determined to have a gain of function mutation in the SCN2A gene. Next. I will report his EEGs for interest here. So, in 2018, so at around the age of eight, um, eight years, he had been documented on an EEG to have sharp and slow wave activity around one and a half to 2.5 hertz with nothing obvious to see. He also, and next button, had shown fast bursts in sleep, some of which had been associated with stiffness. In 2019, He'd had isolated jerks captured, some brief myoclonic looking, others more prolonged and time long to spike and polyspike epileptiform activity. Next. So mum remained concerned, however, not least because his seizures continued, but also that she didn't believe his anti-seizure medicines that we tried, the conventional anti-seizure medicines, um, had really led to any benefit. And she was very keen to trial cannabinoids as she perceived this to be a natural product. Next. So she self-sourced the cannabinoid well, and initially she reported him to be calmer with reduced drop attacks. But she also noted that it would be variable month by month and she herself had wondered whether this was attributed to the batch of oil that she was purchasing um, with the self-sourced cannabinoid oil. And then ultimately he was admitted drowsy and with some abnormal liver function tests. And he was determined to have high norclobazam levels. The whole situation resolved on discontinuation of the cannabinoid oil. 
So now I'd like to, uh, us to do a poll and just for you to answer some key questions. Do you think the resultant admission was likely to be the result of the anti-seizure medicine interaction with cannabinoid oil? Whether the patient is eligible or not for pharmaceutical cannabidiol in the form of epidiolex? And would the abnormal liver function be a contraindication to prescribed CBD? Or indeed, um, a combination of the answers. So if we're gonna put up the poll and ask you to um, answer that. So most um, have determined that the resultant admission was likely to be the result of the interaction of the ASMs with variable um, putting the others or indeed none of the above. Next, you can close the poll and I'll go to the next. It is likely that the admission was the result of the anti-seizure medicine interaction with the cannabis oil. There is, a, as we'll come to later in the presentation, there is a degree of variability in the oils in the concentration of cannabidiol, and this may um, uh, um, produce a variable effect on other interactions. <clears throat> However, he would be, if we think about his diagnosis, although he has an etiological diagnosis of NSCN2A mutation, the electroclinical diagnosis with drop attacks, tonic seizures, fast rhythms in sleep, slow spike and wave on the EEG would be consistent with an uh, electroclinical diagnosis of lennox gastos syndrome, which thereafter could put him um, as eligible for epidiolex. The marginal abnormal LFTs, particularly if they resolved, would not be a contraindication to prescription of this. And I hope all the answers to these questions will be illustrated as we move forward and then we can ultimately result in further discussion. So to start the proceedings, I'd like to invite um, Professor Eugen Schrenker, who's chair of the Department of Neurology in Salzburg, which is indeed also uh, a European reference network, Epicare, the ERN for Rare and Complex Epilepsies Center, and he uh, is on the steering group of the ERN Epicare, and he's going to give an overview about the cannabinoids in the management of the epilepsies. Thank you, Eugen. Thank you very much, Helen. Uh, I think this was an excellent case. So dear friends, dear colleagues, um, uh, where is cannabinoids? Where are cannabinoids in the management of epilepsy? Next one. Um, we have, of course, several new anti-seizure medicines and I grouped it here. Um, in blue are those which are repurposed drugs. So there's a new development that uh, drugs which have been licensed for other indications are now repurposed for, for epilepsy treatment. But there are also other ones in red, which you see here below. These are the ones which are specifically developed for epilepsy. And next slide. In the middle, you see cannabinoids as red because it was developed for epilepsy. You may say, well, this is there for a long time and we have oils and we have this and that but they were not developed for epilepsy. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the history. We have also other options for these um, indications, Lennox Gastro, for example, fenfluramine or tuberous sclerosis, Everolimus. Um, this is not the focus of today. We focus on cannabidiol. Next one. So uh, cannabis and cannabinoid terminology, when we talk about cannabis, for the most part, we talk about cannabis sativa, but also cannabis indica. They differ in their chemical contents, but is the same uh, type of plant. And it is one of the most widely used recreational and medicinal in certain countries, medicinal drugs. More than 150 people worldwide uh, smoking cannabis daily, according to the WHO. And it's very likely to be the first non-food plant cultivated by humans around 8,000 before Christ. Uh, the psychoactive constituent, Delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, short THC, is the one which has the psychoactive uh, component. So we have to distinguish the types of uh, cannabinoid um, um, 
drugs or, or treatments. Um, and this is very important. So one of, first of all, the recreational cannabis. We're not talking about that. We're not talking about the health risks which go into, uh, uh, with come with this uh, type of uh, behavior or, or smoking. Uh, CBD containing consumer and food products. This is important. This is a major market in the last years. And there is a certain, um, there's a certain problem coming with these uh, non-GMP uh, manufactured uh, drugs. Uh, third is the non-regulatory approved cannabis-based products and this cannabis oil, uh, which we uh, had uh, heard from uh, Professor Helen Cross in the first uh, case, might have been one of these drugs. Regulatory approved cannabis-based medicine are uh, exactly that what we want when we want to treat patients with a specific uh, drug with a specific molecule. Next one. So in addition to THC, cannabis also contains many other things, more than 100 cannabinoids and more than 400 non-cannabinoids. The plant cannabinoids are structurally similar to THC. Uh, they have the alkyl chain, which you see here in the chemical formula, a phenol ring, uh, a central pyran ring, and then you have the monounsaturated cyclohexyl ring, giving you a lot of opportunities of variations in the molecular structure and also in the biological effects. And the uh, non-cannabinoids cannabinoid, cannot be ruled out that they have specific effects, but this is under investigation. Eugenol, for example, acts at various ion channels and it might have been an effect which might be pro-convulsive or anti-convulsive or other biological effects. Next one. The endocannabinoid system, we assume, of course, that when we have cannabinoids and they have a psychotropic action, that we must have receptors for that. And it was uh, Raphael Meshulam from the Hebrew University who discovered the endocannabinoid system. Uh, these are uh, basically CB1, uh, the CB1 receptor, which is principally in the central nervous system, affecting neuronal excitability by modulating neurotransmitter release. This is a G-coupled protein uh, in, uh, interfering with the intracellular um, uh, signaling pathways in the presynaptic neuron. And there are, of course, um, agonists, uh, endocannabinoids, which are produced on demand, uh, anandamide and 2-AG, which act on the CB1 receptor. And it, the, the production is again controlled by several other proteins, Dagli and Magli, and, uh, and the activity uh, uh, of the CB1 receptor. And by this pathway, it modulates the neurotransmitter release. Next. So, the endocannabinoid uh, system was named uh, because of uh, THC, but not all cannabinoids acts via the endocannabinoid system. Of the more than 100 plant cannabinoids, uh, it's only three. Uh, it's tetrahana uh, THC, it's CBN, which is a cannabinol, and THCV. All the others don't act on the CB1 or CB2 receptors. And the two non-psychoactive cannabinoids, which have been of particular interest in epilepsy, are cannabidiol and cannabidivarin. And you see the molecular structure, only slight modifications uh, to this drug. And neither functionally interacts with the CB1 receptor endocannabinoid system. Next. But they interact with various other systems. And you see here a list of studies, a range of studies, adenosine uptake, modulation of calcium, uh, intracellular calcium, allosteric modulation of mu and delta opioid receptors. For all of those, you have uh, preclinical evidence, experimental evidence. But all are in vitro and have not been definitely linked to functional effect of whole animals. And they often employ physiological irrelevant high concentrations of the molecule. So in fact, we don't know exactly. Next one. Um, nevertheless, there is a long history and that starts in the Western medicine in the 19th century where medical claims were made for and are still made for 
glaucoma, cramp, gout, burns, appetite stimulation, bowel discomfort, epilepsy, uh, but also other, uh, other indications. And indeed, there are some cannabinoids which are licensed. It's Sativex since 2005, Dronabinol uh, since 1998, Nabilone, a synthetic THC, um, and um, Rimolaband, a CB agonist, anti as anti-obesity drug in 2006. So there are more than 20 years now uh, cannabinoids on the market for these indications, but none for epilepsy, uh, and none is a, a pure plant-derived epilepsy such as epidemics. Next one. Um, we have the regulatory approval, and this is quite interesting. The FDA approved Epidiolex uh, CBD for the treatment of seizures associated with lennox gastaut syndrome, Dravé, or tuberous sclerosis in patients one year of age or older. And the European Medicines Agency said that Epidiolex is indicated as adjunctive treatment for Lennox, Dravé, adjunctive to Clobazam for patients two years of age. Nota bene, it has exactly the same evidence which led to these different decisions, but they also said that Epidiolex is uh, um, indicated as adjunctive treatment in tuberous sclerosis for patients two years older without clobazam. So I explain you later why this came. Next one. So just a brief history, 10th century before uh, Christ, um, and in the 10th century, Ali, uh, Ibn al-Basa al-Mayusi makes the first written record uh, of its use for this purpose. There are other persons who make also the claims, and I'm not sure whether this is historically correct, but it goes to the 15th, uh, to the 10th century. And in the 15th century, there are quite detailed reports, uh, such as Ibn al-Badri, for example, um, treatment of epilepsy of the Caliph's Chamberlain um, with cannabinoids. It cured him completely, but he became an addict who would not for a moment be without the drug. So these are quite interesting reports, but the science started in the 19th century. For example, Moreau and Reynolds have been outstanding figures. And Reynolds, the um, Queen Victoria's personal physician, said that it was the most useful agents uh, with which I'm acquainted in the treatment of attacks or violent convulsions, which may recur two or three times in the hour, and the good dose of hemp cured this. So there are signs, but there are signs in different direction. Next one. Um, but it came to scientific interest. And as I said, uh, Raphael Mechulam made also the first studies in uh, 1978, followed by several others. These were controlled studies, but completely underpowered. So you could not make any result out of that, except that you can use it and uh, mild side effects, most often drowsiness. Next one. The preclinical evidence also increased over the past years. And next, what you see is that CBD most often has in the clinical models in different species, anticonvulsive uh, properties, Whereas the other cannabinoids, they have um, also, such as THC, for example, proconvulsive or no effect uh, in these specimens. Next one. So one of the uh, activities, next one, and you can uh, yeah, go through this, uh, is the magnesium free and four uh, aminopyridine epileptic form activity. I think this study was quite interesting. It's uh, more than 10 years ago. It was a multi-electrode array recording from validated in vitro models of uh, um, red hippocampal slices. And what you see here in the, the lower graph is that the total signal power was significantly reduced at concentration at 0.1 micromolar. And the effects were comparable to felbamate and phenobarbital which have been the most effective drugs in this model. So that was a very good response in this um, um, preclinical model. Next one. The classical models, pilocapine model on the left and penicillin model on the, on the right, they also showed CBD some efficacy. Next slide. Um, and it was modest in the pilocapine model in lowering the incidence of the most severe seizure types. Uh, and it had significant effect in the penicillin model. Next one. 
Um, what I like is this uh, static beam array uh, experiment. So you have uh, uh, mice or rats, which uh, uh, you let run from the box in the middle, about one meter on a, on a small um, um, bridge. Um, and you see how the mouse behaves when she gets certain drugs. So, um, and the comparators in this uh, experiment were valproic acid, etosuximide, and phenobarbital. And you see clearly uh, in this uh, graph that the uh, passes were extremely well when you used uh, CBD, which you see here on the uh, right part of the, of the pass uh, diagrams. Uh, as compared to the dose-dependent decrease in motor activity. And the same is true for the number of foot slips. Uh, the left lower uh, diagram shows the number of foot slip with the conventional drugs and the foot slip for um, CBD was very low. And the, also the distance traveled in the right lower diagram was much uh, further with uh, CBD as compared to valproic acid, etosuximide, and phenobarbital, so indicating good tolerability. Next. Um, the drug itself has some pharmacokinetic um, um, difficult uh, aspects, or I would say aspects with uh, which you have to get used to it, the low bioavailability, um, the absorption may be saturable, uh, it's highly lipophilic and it has a high volume of distribution and high protein binding. Uh, the plasma half-life is around 50 to 60 hours after twice daily dosing. And it's extensively metabolized, leading also to interactions, mostly via uh, 2C19 and 3A4. Um, and uh, you will have a, a talk after that by Professor Cecil Landmark Johannesson. Next one. The important thing for the simple clinician is 2C19 and 3A4, and we will come to that later. Next one. Um, there are several uh, known interactions, and it's here listed. What you should keep in mind is that always consult uh, these uh, tables or, or papers where you expect and when you're unsure uh, important interactions are with Brivaracetam, with Clobasam, uh, and also with uh, Stiripentol. Next one. The mechanism of action has been elucidated over the past years a little bit more than at, in the initial phase, and it seems to block uh, G protein coupled receptors, uh, regulating the calcium release, and it desensitizes the TRPV1 channels which is the transient receptor potential barniloid. Uh, and it inhibits ENT1 adenosine reuptake pumps. So overall, it's a multiple mechanism of action. Um, the, the net effect is a reduction of neuronal excitability, um, uh, neurotransmitter release, um, and seizure activity. Next one. Clinically, there have been five studies two on Lennox Castro, two on Dravet, and one on tuberous sclerosis. Uh, the study design is very comparable, and the main focus is the number of drop seizures. But what you see here in the Lennox Castro on the left and in the tuberous sclerosis on the right, the inclusion, the age of inclusion was two to 55 and one to 65. So over the whole lifespan, I would say, uh, is this indicated, whereas the Dravé is, was only used in children, but then extrapolated uh, for also use in adults. Next one. So the first study which came out was remarkably, was published uh, straight away in the, Lancet, uh, in, the, in the New England Journal of Medicine, 120 children and young adults uh, in the Dravé syndrome, 2 to 18. And the percent change in seizure frequency was minus 38% with a cannabidiol and 13% 30 with placebo. Highly significant difference. Next one. So the side effects were quite tolerable. Uh, it was mainly diarrhea, uh, fatigue, um, and decreased appetite and somnolence in the active treatment group. But 
65% of the patients had clobosomous communication, uh, and there is a pharmacokinetic interaction with an increase of clobosom and uh, not clobosom. And the serum levels in this study were not reported. Next one. Uh, another study led by Elizabeth Thiele um, looked at the uh, seizure frequency in Lenox Castor, published in Lancet. Um, 171 patients, Lenox Castor, a, a mixed etiology, as we saw also from the case, at least two drop seizures per week were the inclusion criteria, and they used uh, uh, 20 milligram per kilogram uh, oral uh, cannabi cannabidiol daily. Um, you see the seizure reduction of the main seizure, the drop attacks uh, during the treatment period, it was 43 and the maintenance period 48%. Um, and uh, about 64% uh, uh, had a seizure reduction in the add-on cannabidiol group of more than uh, 25% and 24% had a seizure reduction of more than 75%. So again, one of those, uh, this is one of the key study leading to the licensing. Next one. Um, the tolerability and safety aspects and the, the adverse events, they can be pooled in a study and you see a clear pattern, somnolence, decreased appetite, diarrhea, um, fatigue uh, are the key elements of the uh, adverse event profile. Next one. When you have a similar study design and there is homogeneity uh, of the uh, inclusion criteria, um, you can make a meta-analysis, which you see here, a systematic review, and you clearly see that the uh, efficacy is in favor of uh, cannabidiol, 10 milligram per kilogram and 20 milligram per kilogram for all seizure types on the left and for the convulsive seizure types on the right, highly significant. It's about 20 fold um, more likely to, um, to be a responder uh, with the active drug as, comp as compared to placebo. Next one. So the pharmacokinetic inaction uh, was a big discussion, especially in the, in the licensing. And the question was uh, taken by the European Medicines Agency, whether there is an independent anti-epileptic effect or it is only due to the combination. So they gave a, 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 a they said it's only uh, eligible when you give a clobasam. But single patient analysis suggests that there is an independent effect. Next one, I will, um, go quickly through this study, which um, used a single patient analysis. So we uh, looked at the CBD treated patients, uh, 250, and the placebo treated patients, um, 240 were clobosome on in the CBD arm, and 150 were clobosome on in the placebo arm, and compared it to those who were clobosome off, that were 189 in the CBD arm and 127 were uh, clobosome off in the placebo arm. Next one. So when you look at that, and these are the combined analysis, 10 milligram and 20 milligram uh, per kilogram per day, and you have clobosome off at the top and clobosome on uh, in the lower diagram. And the, uh, the rhombus, which you see here, or the diamond shape, is clearly on the right side, which favors uh, cannabidiol as an independent, independently acting drug, irrespective whether there is clobosome as baseline medication or not. Next one. So uh, even if you combine it at any dose with the primary outcome parameter, um, that there is an independent effect. So the 50% reduction in seizure frequency, which was the main judgment criteria for the European Medicines Agency in clobosome off patients was similar to the one in clobosome on patients. So the risk ratio 1.8 in clobosome off patients and 1.85 in clobosome on patients. So both arms calculating like this with the primary judgment criteria for the EMA showed highly significant results. Next one. So there is another trial which um, 
was so clear that there was no discussion about uh, clobazam, yes or no, that was with uh, tuberous sclerosis. And you see here um, in, the, in the higher treatment group and in the uh, lower treatment group of 25 and 50 milligram, you see a clear uh, reduction in seizure frequency of more than 40% and uh, close to 40% were 50% responder. Next one. But there is not the end yet. There is, of course, off-label information, uh, off-label treatment, um, and uh, the CBD epidiolex have been used in several other indications. Um, next slide. Um, for example, uh, CDKL5 deficiency, doses syndrome, Sturge waiver, Syngab1, with various um, results, I would say, or experiences, none of these a trial was, of course, controlled, and um, there is a high risk of bias. It's the publication bias, but uh, this drug is uh, going to be used in the community for several uh, epilepsy syndromes. Next one. I come to the conclusion that the approval process, which was a little bit tricky on the European side, it was more straightforward in the US side, the approval of the highly purified form of uh, CBD, uh, it's uh, called epidiolex, is a tipping point in the medical use of cannabinoids for the treatment of seizure disorders. And it is the first FDA authorized drug deriving from the cannabis plant rather than made synthetically. And I showed you the other indications. CBD inhibits several aspects, including calcium uh, channels, intracellular calcium ion levels and uh, inhibits adenosine reuptake, but the precise mechanism uh, is, uh, is unknown. It has low oral bioavailability and a high pharmacokinetic variability. It's a potent inhibitor of cytochrome P450. Uh, stay tuned for the next talk and the potential of drug-drug interaction exists. It's effective in reducing seizure frequency in patients with Larus Gasto, Dravet syndrome, tuberous sclerosis, independent of co-medication, drowsiness, somnolence, decreased appetite, diarrhea, and increased uh, serum aminotransferases are the main adverse effect. And I think uh, there is more to come with other uh, rare disease indications with uh, cannabidiol. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eugen, um, for that excellent overview. And so to move on, um, just remind everybody to put any questions they may have in the Q&A, um, the logo is at the bottom of the screen, and we'll endeavor to just answer them in the panel discussion um, at the end. So now I um, introduce Professor Cecily Johannesson Landmark from um, the Epilepsy Center in, uh, uh, National Epilepsy Center in Norway and also Oslo Metropolitan University who is going to talk about the pharmacokinetics and interactions of cannabidiol. Thank you, Cecily. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for uh, the very comprehensive introduction from uh, Eugen. He touched upon uh, uh, some of these main uh, issues, but I will give you a deep dive into the pharmacokinetic uh, processes and also to uh, examples of the pharmacokinetic interactions that have been demonstrated so far. Uh, so this is an overview of uh, the pharmacokinetics when you give cannabidiol in this uh, oil formulation. Um, the absorption is variable and it's poor, and I will show you more uh, about it. It's widely distributed. <coughs> it's uh, highly um, uh, fat soluble, but it will be, of course, distributed to the brain. Um, but it's also bound uh, heavily to uh, albumin in the, in the blood. Then it comes to um, uh, metabolism, uh, where it's uh, extensively metabolized, and uh, it gives rise to interactions with other drugs, as we had uh, also had an introduction to. Uh, next slide, please. Here you see some more of these uh, uh, details, um, because usually uh, the absorption of uh, uh, anti-seizure medications that we use, uh, it's uh, complete or uh, at least at, at least 80, 90% of a dose 
will uh, be um, found in the serum afterwards. Here, the bioavailability is about 6%. So uh, most of the drug that we give will just pass through uh, due to uh, pre-systemic metabolism. Um, so uh, uh, we can then say that uh, absorption is minimal and it's also variable between uh, patients. I'll also show you uh, a study uh, demonstrating that if you take cannabidiol with a fat-rich meal, uh, the absorption will be four to five-fold uh, increased actually. Uh, distribution. Uh, most of uh, cannabidiol is bound to proteins and therefore the volume of distributions will be uh, uh, enormous uh, and physiologically high. And when it comes to um, uh, interactions in the blood uh, about uh, displacement interactions with other highly bound uh, drugs, this has not been very extensively shown uh, yet, but it's commonly used with valproate or with steropental that are also highly protein-bound drugs. Uh, it's uh, metabolized through several pathways, also as uh, Eugen mentioned, <clears throat> and it has strong enzyme-inhibiting uh, properties. If it uh, works on P-glycoprotein and transport mechanisms, we don't know yet, but it has an active metabolite. And um, there is a risk of liver toxicity as uh, up to 20% uh, of the participants in the clinical studies had to uh, uh, withdraw due to uh, more than threefold increase in uh, uh, liver enzymes. Next, please. So here you see uh, actually the first uh, uh, comprehensive study of uh, dose and serum concentration um, uh, relationships. Uh, and you can take also the next one, please, with the details. And this was from uh, 127 samples uh, in patients with ledox costo or Dravet syndrome. And um, uh, it shows a wide variability uh, with a, a common dose of, for instance, 10 milligrams per kilo per day. As you see, you might get <coughs> very low uh, serum concentrations or uh, up to medium to, uh, to high. Uh, this was, um, of course, um, dependent on uh, co-medication. It was dependent on uh, absorption and also uh, of age, because in the youngest children, they had a higher clearance. Next, please. <clears throat> interactions uh, with anti-seizure medications, where we might have pharmacodynamic interactions and pharmacokinetic interactions. And uh, preclinical studies so far shows that there is a pharmacodynamic interaction between cannabidiol and clobazam. So you'll have a synergistic effect and a better um, effect if you give both of them. But there, there will also be a pharmacokinetic interaction. So uh, pharmacokinetics uh, is about the processes of uh, how uh, the uh, drugs affect the body, <clears throat> and especially at the site of uh, metabolism uh, in the liver, there will be uh, interactions with uh, several other drugs. The clinical impact of this is uh, difficult to predict in the individual patient. And uh, you have to ask uh, the patients how they are doing. And perhaps uh, you can also um, uh, measure the serum concentrations if you have the possibility to adjust for uh, such interactions. Next, please. Uh, this is an overview of the interactions <coughs> that has been mentioned. And uh, also to the right, you see interactions with the uh, food and also interaction with genes. But if we look at the main part of the figure, uh, you see that uh, cannabidiol may be affected by enzyme-inducing drugs, but this is not so commonly combined. Uh, enzyme-inhibiting drugs as uh, steropental uh, moderately. And uh, most uh, of the drugs that are used in combination with the cannabidiol uh, may be inhibited by um, the cannabidiol uh, itself, like steropental, the clobosam, especially desmetylclobosam, the active metabolite. Uh, and the brivaris term so far has shown significant um, uh, impact on this. And I will show you some figures. Um, next, please. So this interaction uh, with food, 
uh, the F or the bioavailability might increase up to four to five fold, as you see here from the fasted to the fed state. In this phase one study where uh, healthy volunteers were given a very fat rich and, and quite heavy uh, breakfast. <clears throat> and it shows that the, the variability in absorption will be less um, and uh, the uh, output or uh, the uh, the absorbed part of the cannabidiol will increase significantly if it's taken together with food. So I think that's an important take home message. Next, please. <clears throat> uh, this shows the pharmacokinetic interaction with the cannabidiol and clobazam, and it's actually a two way interaction between uh, the two because cannabidiol will. Uh, uh, inhibit uh, clobazam and especially increase the active metabolite desmetylclobazam up to three to four fold. And you just have to excuse me if you hear a dog barking in the background. Uh, I'll, I hope it will stop. Um, and on the other hand, um, uh, clobazam will also inhibit the metabolism of cannabidiol so that the active metabolite will actually increase significantly as well. Uh, next, please. In this uh, case study, it showed that in one patient, but uh, we can expect it will uh, uh, be a relevant and very clinically relevant interaction in those <laughs> with tuberous sclerosis using Ebrolimus, because when they started with cannabidiol, the concentration of Ebrolimus uh, significantly increased. This is due to inhibition of CPDA4, uh, which is the main a pathway of metabolism for uh, ebrolimus, and which is actually one of the, the main pathways through the liver for a lot of other drugs. Ebrolimus has a very uh, narrow therapeutic uh, range and it has to be monitored very closely. So I think this is an uh, interaction that we should be aware of. Next, please. <coughs> uh, another example I will show you is the interaction with citalopram. It's the most commonly used uh, SSRI in depression. So for patients with uh, uh, psychiatric comorbidity using other psychoactive uh, drugs that are metabolized through these common pathways for uh, this class of drugs, CYP2C19, CYP3A4, and CYP2D6, uh, it shows here uh, a significant uh, uh, increase in uh, citalopram in this uh, example, but it will be also relevant for other similar uh, drugs for those patients with uh, such polypharmacy. So I guess we will see more examples uh, when we have uh, more um, widely measurements of different combinations with cannabidiol. Next, please. So these examples shows that if we measure the serum concentrations of the drugs uh, that will uh, most often here be victims of the inhibition of uh, cannabidiol, uh, you uh, may uh, uh, control for the interactions by adjusting the dosage in the individual patient because it's highly unpredictable. Uh, and thus uh, therapeutic uh, drug monitoring uh, may be used um, when each patient is their own control and when they start with a new drug, you can adjust um, the dosage of uh, the affected drugs uh, accordingly. Uh, next, please. So in summary, uh, we have uh, looked more into the pharmacokinetic challenges when it comes to limited and variable absorption. <coughs> the um, uh, uh, inhibition of um, liver metabolism and individual variability. There are interactions with food, drugs, and also with genes in those who are poor metabolizers. And it's difficult to uh, predict this um, if we don't uh, uh, measure. Also, uh, it's important to uh, uh, titrate uh, the drug carefully, uh, measure the serum concentrations if you have the possibility, and also follow with safety biochemical markers as the liver enzymes. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Cecily, um, for that lovely overview of the interactions of pharmacokinetics. And I'm delighted to hear your dog so enthusiastic about um, the topic today. Anyway, we'll return to you in a bit when we have the questions again. 
any questions, and I can see they're flowing in, please type them into the Q&A button at the bottom, um, and we'll attempt to address those um, when we come to the end of the presentations. So what I'm going to do over the next few slides is um, just summarise perhaps where we're at um, with regard to the cannabinoids in clinical practice. Next slide. So as Eugen has illustrated, there are randomised controlled trial data for utilisation of a pharmaceutically prepared and uh, now regulatory approved epidiol, um, Epidiolex, in treatment of Lennox-Gastaut syndrome or the epilepsy associated with Lennox-Gastaut syndrome, Jave syndrome and tuberous sclerosis. And depending on where you are in the world, it may be uh, from a different age, um, either one or two years, and indeed with or without combination with COBSAM. Next slide. But of course, the question remains, um, is it only in the epilepsy specific to these um, diseases that canidipidal is indeed effective? Or as we predict, you know, the regulatory approval has been given for where there is evidence for which there is randomized controlled trial data. And we don't have any evidence that it's having a very specific mechanism of action for these specific epilepsies. And it is highly likely as demonstrated through open label studies that efficacy may be demonstrated in epilepsies associated with a wide range of different etiologies. Next slide. So the availability of um, Epidiolex or pure cannabidiol as Epidiolex for prescription is probably reimbursement related, dependent on the approval um, within the area in which um, the individual lives. And whether or not it is required in combination with Prozam for prescription um, for the approval process is also dependent on region. We have to beware, of course, of other interactions that could be clinically relevant, as is illustrated by the previous two speakers. And the other piece of um, information I think is important to share is that there may be mild derangement of liver function tests on the introduction of cannabidiol, particularly when used in conjunction with sodium valparate. But on the whole, these do tend to resolve when there's a degree of fluctuation, just as we see with utilization of valparate per se. The questions, however, remain, as I've mentioned, is it effective over a wider range of epilepsies? There's no reason why we shouldn't be prescribing it over a wider range of epilepsies. This appears to be strictly reimbursement um, uh, restricted. And would the other question, of course, that um, patients um, put out there on a regular basis, would the addition of tetrahydrocannabinol or THC confer greater effects? Next slide. So what about other cannabinoids? Next slide. Again, as Eugen summarized, a cannabinoid is not a single product. And we have different products, um, which of course have reached different degrees of um, safety and indeed regulatory approval. We have the recreational cannabis and hemp, which is non-licensed. And also of course the food products, again, non-licensed, non-GMP, non-GDP, which I'll come to. We have good medical practice um, uh, GMP products that are non-licensed, they're non-regulatory approved, and they on the whole contain varying degrees of CBD with THC. And then we have the regulatory approved cannabis-based medicine, i.e. Epidiolex. Next slide. Now, one of the arguments put forward about the use, need to use natural products is actually there are also not just the cannabinoids within the product, but also the non-cannabinoid compounds, not least terpenes, which represent the largest group of cannabis phytochemicals. And they, we know that they easily cross cell membranes and blood-brain barrier. Um, and there's been put forward the theory that maybe there's an entourage effect between cannabinoids and terpenes. Maybe the terpenes, terpenes enhance the cannabinoid effect, but this really is a theory and has no um, direct proof at the present time. Next slide. The issue with many of the cannabinoid oils is the lack of consistency of content. And this, I mean, mainly the food products that are sold and the availability of products over the internet. And there are two studies that I'll illustrate, but other studies as well have demonstrated that if you take um, different batches of the same um, product or the same oil, there will be a variability in the degree of CBD and other um, cannabinoid content within it. 
weather it. And if you just press the next three buttons, Gus, that'd be great. Um, oh, that's not got on it. Okay, that's fine. Just stay there. That's fine. Um, so you either have the um, too much cannabidiol or too little cannabidiol than has been declared, or indeed no cannabidiol at all. But if you go back to the previous slide, Gus, and this is seen oil 11, very little in the way of um, uh, cannabidiol was indeed determined, even though being sold as a cannabinoid oil, cannabidiol oil. Next slide. And there is also an issue with regard to labeling. And again, this study um, took a whole variety of products from different um, uh, um, uh, sales agents, some are batches, different batches of the same product, looked at the labeling, determined the amount of CBD D and THC and demonstrating a major discrepancy between what was actually within the product and indeed what had been labelled as such um, and produced with the product as it was sold. So even between batches of the same supposed product, there could be a high degree of CBD variability and even variable amounts of THC. Next slide. But we have to remember that good manufacturing practice, GMP, and good distribution practice are not relating to the product. They're actually relating to the facility for which these products are produced. So when we're talking about the next level, which is GMP and GDP um, approved products, that relates to the facilities in which they're produced, not the actual final product. Um, and there are various preparations um, available, um, uh, not necessarily approved, regulatory approved, but actually available. And some of these products may actually be um, uh, made up in pharmacies, um, the galanic products actually produced, and then various combinations about the concentration required produced in pharmacies. And next slide. And even when this has actually been assessed, there is a degree of variability, even when they've been made up to specific prescriptions in the percentage or the amount of CBD in the product, depending on which product you're looking at, or indeed the proportion of THC. Next slide. So is there evidence base that we, you know, addition of THC may actually confer any greater benefit? Next slide. Well, we all know that um, there are ongoing studies about utilization of um, full cannabis. I accept this is full cannabis. This is not talking about cannabinoid products um, that may be used in the treatment of epilepsy. But there are a lot of evidence that um, cannabis exposure prenatally may have an effect all the way through life subsequently on an individual. And there's a lot of um, evidence that that effect can be on um, the developing brain. The, the um, effect is presumed to be related to THC, but the, about the degree or the percentage or the, the amount of THC that may be required to confer that, that harm is unknown. Next slide. There are, of course, open label studies of combination compounds, not usually, uh, but usually with a relatively high percentage of CBT and a very low percentage of THC. And many of these compounds utilized in view of the fact that, that pure CBD was not available. But that said, the data that is actually seen in these open label studies doesn't look that dissimilar to what you might see in the randomized controls of cannabidiol. And this in a study of children with Dravet syndrome, 20 children treated consecutively with a um, uh, cannabis oil product of 100 milligrams per mil CBD, two milligrams per mil THC. You can see that 12 out of the 20 had more than a 50% reduction in seizures over a 20 week intervention. Um, and this is 60%, because I think is majorly higher, but considering this is open label, not dissimilar to what may be seen with the CBD products, uh, the pure CBD product. And the next slide, and then this more recent open label study from Israel, again, looked at um, efficacy in this open label, bit wider age range, again, 20 to one CBD to THC, um, with a responder rate again of around 54%, so 54% having more than a 50% reduction in seizures. But what they also noted was a degree of tolerance in a quarter of patients after a very limited period of time, something that actually hasn't been reported in um, the pure cannabidiol studies and the longer term um, uh, open label studies beyond the end of clinical trials. Next. 
And I think even um, more revealing perhaps is this study, which actually was reported from Colorado. Again, open label study, looking at 75 patients who um, uh, had, uh, um, were utilizing cannabis extracts for the treatment of epilepsy. And of course, Colorado was one, the first state that actually um, le uh, was, uh, it was legal to prescribe these um, products. And therefore, some families quite desperate to obtain the products move to Colorado in order to obtain the prescriptions for the products. And you can see that actually 57% in total reported no improvement in seizure control. 33% a third reported a 50% reduction in seizures. But the next button, Gus, overall, um, the, the overwhelming evidence from this was that if the family had moved to Colorado for the cannabis, the responder rate was 47%, but only 22% responded for those who were already in Colorado, suggesting a high um, placebo effect. Next. There is a need for randomized control data. So there's no doubt there is a place for cannabis-based medicinal products um, in the treatment of the epilepsies, but it is a little dependent on how they're defined and how they are utilized. They are not a panacea. We have to use appropriate formulations to make sure that they're appropriately utilized and appropriately monitored. At the present time, there isn't evidence for the additional requirement for THC, tetrahydrocannabinol. We have a question about the safety in the developing brain, and is there, in addition, the additional efficacy? And therefore, we're not saying that we shouldn't look at this. We need to undertake further study and determine what is the appropriate way to go forward for our patients. So on that note, I'd like to welcome um, my two co-panelists back through video and um, microphone. And we can embark on answering some of the questions. You've all been really active in um, producing those questions for, for us. And the first question um, uh, th that's come up is, how often should liver function tests be checked? Eugen, do you have a view on that? Yeah, so we check it um, and, th and that's not specific to CBD, we, we check it usually, uh, and that might be not appropriate in every country um, because of the resources. After two weeks, after four weeks, and after three months. So if the liver function increases, uh, increases in the first, uh, let's say, after two weeks, we check again next week. So then we increase the frequency. So the, the uh, gamma GT is not the one which we are concerned. It's the uh, uh, amino transferases, uh, which, are, uh, which are the ones which are problematic. Uh, so gamma GT uh, is not something of concern, but the, uh, the uh, other liver enzymes are of concern. So we do it two weeks, four weeks, and 12 weeks. Yeah, we do the same. Uh, and also we will have a have a follow-up at six months and also yeah. at one year uh, now in the initial phase. Yeah. Okay. Well, again, one of the questions, I'm afraid this is very specifically for you. Have you used CBD in adults without epileptic encephalopathy? In adults without epileptic encephalopathy? No. No. Okay. Um, not CBD. Um, but various other cannabinoid products have been used by the patients themselves. And then they come and say, uh, we take this or we take that. And uh, I'm not uh, a doctor who says, no, stop it. Uh, so we are going the, this way together, but I fully agree with what um, uh, Helen has said and explained in the last uh, um, part. It's very important. We need studies for doing that. So my clear choice is that we take the approved drugs then we know what we do, or at least we know better. We understand better what we do, uh, and we need further research for all the other for all the other things. Okay, thank you. Um, this is probably to the both of you, and then I'll take a question. Um, th th is the overall opinion on the combined clobazam with cannabinoid therapy? We know what the data is there. I suppose the issue is: is it synergistic, or is it the fact? we're seeing 
an independent effect? Is it all Kilbazam, do you think? I, I, if I may say that, because we, we put together all the data and based on what we have, based on the evidence here, it's definitely not related to Clobazam increase. There is an independent effect which shows very clear when you have this single uh, patient analysis. Um, and uh, so first answer is very clear. It has an independent effect. Number two, there is an interaction which may have a pharmacokinetic in terms of uh, you know high, getting higher efficacy, but what you also see in that you get higher rate of adverse effect, more drowsiness uh, in the combination with uh, clobazam. So, like with every other drug with pharmacokinetic interactions, um, you have to take uh, care of that. That the adverse effect is very often related to the drug which increases and not to the drug which which you use in first instance. Uh, and also, I would. Just like to add that uh, uh, we have to deal with this because uh, the approval uh, says that you have to use it in a combination. So uh, so it's not something that you can just avoid because you think it might cause trouble, but you have to consider it. You have to use it and you have to combine it in a safe way and monitor uh, the best you can. Thanks. Um, there's a question here, is CBD able to use for children with West syndrome? Um, the first thing to say is that um, there was a study initiated in infantile spasms, which did not show benefit um, and therefore was terminated early. That's And also, I think the, the issue is now that we are not utilizing it for refractory um, spasms because of the age limitation on the prescription as well with regard to epidalax. So I think, you know, it probably is something else that could be used in older children for spasms for trial, but I don't have any evidence that it actually is beneficial. And my own experience has been, it's not particularly helpful for spasms, but um, that's our initial um, review. And is there a role of CBD in refractory status epilepticus? There has been reports of utilization in fires, for example, in febrile induced refractory status epilepticus. Um, and what the data suggests is that um, there are some reports of some benefit um, in combination with other things acutely, but probably more benefit in the ongoing seizures, the residuum from fires, if you see what I mean, rather than the acute status. So there are case reports where it's been helpful, but there is not a lot of data. Eugen, I don't know whether you want to comment anything on more. Oh, on I agree. I agree. This is uh, there are some other um, data on NORS and, and CBD, uh, not the FIRES variant. Uh, and uh, beware of the high publication bias uh, in these in these types of cases. There is um, almost every drug has been tried in super refractory status epilepticus uh, to more or less uh, with more or less success. So I would be very uh, cautious. We did it also once in a very desperate case. And it did not work. Uh, had many side effects in the high dose, and there is the absorption problem uh, with the gastric paresis and with the uh, uh, lack of absorption in intensive care. Okay. Thank you. There is a question here, but I think it's more of a general question about um, use of anti-seizure medicines. It says, why are animals given drugs as phenobarbital and used in, and used in studies for cannabis as for use in humans? Yeah, phenobarbital is not usually recommended for humans. Is there a difference that animals are used for study? Well, yes, we use animals different than humans uh, when we study things. And uh, uh, in this study, I think the most important thing was to make a, 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 a test about the uh, tolerability, if you're referring to that. And the other one was, of course, phenobarbital is a very strong GABAergic drug. It's one of the best GABAergic drugs which we have in terms of efficacy. Uh, and etosuximide is an uh, absence specific drug. And if you want to explore some uh, aspects, I think it's better to model that in the animal than in the humans. That was the reason. It is not to be extrapolated to the human field, but there was a reason behind the choice of the comparators. Uh, and also, I would like to add that very often the pharmacokinetics is very different in animals than in humans. So uh, you should absolutely not uh, extrapolate uh, the exposure that you have or the uh, 
effects uh, based on time that you see in animal models as compared to humans. Thanks. There are several questions on a utilization of cannabidiol with ketogenic diet. And I have used it to a limited extent. Um, I have to say in patients who are on a classical diet, it does appear to increase ketosis, a combination with cannabidiol and ketogenic diet. There are increasing ketosis, probably through the effects of ketone production in the liver. It doesn't appear to be the same with other types of diet. So when we introduce cannabidiol, they're usually already on the ketogenic diet. Then we usually have to, if they're on a classical diet, reduce the ratio because otherwise they become quite hyperketotic. But I have used it in combination. There is also, however, the question about, um, you know, the absorption with a high fat diet. Um, and um, I know I've not experienced an issue with this clinically, but I don't know, Cecily, whether you want to comment on something about that. And uh, we don't have uh, the experience ourselves yet, but uh, we will go uh, give some uh, general advice on uh, how to take cannabidiol uh, together with uh, some fat re rich uh, food with some uh, uh, specific examples, but we cannot uh, live up to this uh, very, uh, uh, very heavy uh, 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 meal that was uh, used in the um, study, of course, but uh, from a point of view of absorption process and what uh, this phase one study has shown, I would uh, assume that uh, you will have a more stable and a better absorption if it's combined with the ketogenic diet. But uh, I've just seen uh, one poster presentation. Uh, I think uh, you were involved in that, uh, Helen, so far, yes. so that uh, there is not much uh, evidence, but based on the on the mechanisms and um, and uh, then I would uh, guess that it could be a favorable combination. Sure, thank you. Um, there is a question about the fact that possibly was one clinical study by GW on absence seizures and the results not published. Any future studies on absence seizures, any opinions? I'm not aware of any future studies. I know there's been a lot of talk about genetic generalized epilepsies and possible studies um, proposed in some of those syndromes but actually not specifically absent seizures. Eugen, have you got any other information? Uh, there is, uh, there is, I think, at least one uh, investigator-initiated study in, right. in absent seizures uh, um, based on EG parameters. So the, the problem is, of course, counting the absences when there are too many or, or, or not enough. Uh, so the difficulty lies in the methodology, but there are EEG um, uh, pharmaco EG studies looking at that. No data uh, available at the moment. Um, there's a question here about if there are any specific epilepsy syndrome or conditions that CBD will increase the seizure frequency. They have a very specific um, uh, patient who had generalized tonic clonic seizures um, increase to daily from monthly. Um, but a shorter duration of seizure. Um, and this was not a, this wasn't Epidiolex, it was a different product. I think my, my only experience with an increase in seizures is where, whereby parents have been absolutely convinced that they should only utilize the CBD product and therefore have tried to address weaning other anti-epileptic drugs, not necessarily specifically. And I, my thought there was that the CBD wasn't having benefit and the other drugs were having more benefit than was thought. Um, but I actually haven't specifically seen an aggravation of seizures due to CBD. I'm not sure whether you've had experience of that, Eugen, or are you aware of that? Well, the, the question was? Whether there's aggravation or increase of seizures due to CBD okay. in any specific type of epilepsy. I was uh, just uh, typing that in because there was one question about withdrawal and seizure yes. aggravation after yes. that. I was, I'm not aware of that. And I didn't see it. Uh, it also did not come out in the in the study reports more than usual. So there is no sign that uh, it causes seizure aggravation uh, after withdrawal. And have you? Um, okay. And and have you got any about the evidence of withdrawing CBD? And the, and I, there is a question here somewhere about that. I couldn't. You said you were typing it, but did you yeah, comment on that? <laughs> Uh, I think it was that question. But, uh, so the, 
no withdrawal uh, increase in seizure, like we see with levetiracetam yes. yes. or tabamazepine or phenobarbital. Uh, and uh, so um, no experience with that. And I also don't know it from the literature. Um, there's a question here about neuropsychiatric symptoms um, and whether there is any real evidence about the neuropsychiatric safety of the oils. And I think that's one of the questions we raised really. It's a bit unknown. I think some of the kids that we see who use the combination oils are sometimes reported to be calmer. Um, but the issue is, is what may or not happen in the longer term. We don't know. Um, Eugen, I don't know if you've got any comment on that. Um, no, I'm not. Can you repeat the question? I was sorry. <laughs> it's about neuropsychiatric symptoms. Yeah. And I think one of the issues is, and our concerns is maybe the THC component might cause things. I think the, the question is about experience with neuropsychiatric safety of pure CBD. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. So uh, thank you. Um, so the um, psychiatric problematic with THC is, uh, to my opinion, underestimated. It's also underestimated with the recreational use of cannabinoids. There are more and more good data to show that this is not harmless as it is very often said, uh, but it's not related to CBD content. So the CBD content and the pure uh, CBD derived drug epidiolex, there is no uh, psychiatric or, or, or psycho, psychomimetic effect uh, noticeable uh, within this indication where the randomized control, control trials were done. So this is definitely not the case here. Okay. And related, um, one person said, using CBD, I've observed better improvement in cognition that seems not to be linked to the actual seizure reduction. Do we have any comments about that? I have to say, time and time again, parents report on starting Epidiolex that they are cognitively better, their communication has improved. And that is despite no apparent reduction in seizures. In some, there is a reduction in seizures, there's no doubt. But in others, there isn't. And um, it can be very difficult then to start saying whether CBD should be continued on the basis of just seizure reduction in view of the benefits that have been reported. What's difficult is to quantify that. Um, but certainly families do report that. Um, and it is difficult, you know, so then there's the additional, you know, what else is going on? It's not just reduction of seizures. Yeah, and I think this is an important point in, in uh, satisfaction for, of treatment. So how the, the parents or the caregivers or the, the partners judge uh, the, uh, this positive effect in behavior. Okay, so um, if a patient has a good, well, this is about tolerance really, if a patient has a good response with CBD, is this maintained over time? Is there a time range in which the response is maintained? So I think there's a, there's a question about whether they become tolerant to the effect. This is a very difficult question. It's a, a, about tolerance and regression to the mean. And uh, probably it can, of course, be regression to the mean also that you simply have uh, good times and bad times and you tend to um, uh, add a medication where the patient has a high seizure frequency, even if the medication has no effect and the seizures uh, go down and the situation becomes better in, in many other aspects. So that would be regression to the mean. Um, so um, tolerance is something which has to be replicated, which has to be a constant phenomenon and which is most of the time not only related to seizures. It's uh, most of the time it's related to the adverse effects. We know that all from sodium channel blockers, the good phenomenon of tolerance makes you feel less dizzy and uh, the drug is better tolerated. So uh, with CBD, I would not say to my personal opinion, it's a drug where tolerance occurs, but it's not, it's only anecdotal. And I, I agree with that. I don't think we've seen evidence that that's the case. And many of my patients that I initiated it on pre-trial as open label uh, remain on it, I have to say. 
Um, there's a question about CBD use with valparate and if the liver enzymes start to increase significantly. If so, when do we expect them to return to baseline? I think the issue is, is they, it, it depends what you mean by significantly. When we looked at the clinical trial, we used the upper, um, more than three times the upper limit of normal as an indication of liver injury. But I think actually some of mine went to three and a half, four times normal and then began to come down. And usually they are coming down within a week or two. They don't start, they don't continue to increase. So, um, and they may, may not, in combination with Valparate, they may not completely return to baseline, but they return to marginally abnormal, not significantly abnormal. So um, I think if, it, if uh, liver enzymes were seen to be more than four times the upper limit of normal and still rising, then I would really begin to think that this needs to be withdrawn. Eugen? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, I think one thing which should never be forgotten is that it's a it's a clinical diagnosis. So the lab values in, in, in valproic acid uh, and uh, hepatopathy are not the best indicator. It's uh, the person feels sick, uh, doesn't do well, and there are other uh, phenomena too uh, when valproic is, is the perpetrator. Uh, and also the thrombocyte should be looked at and not only the liver enzymes and um, it's better to control the patient clinically and lab-wise, but not only one thing alone. Yeah. Um, there is a question which is about in patients with gastrostomy, what is the administration recommendation? I know that usually um, it was previously advised that you shouldn't put it down a gastrostomy. We did this quite successfully as long as there was an adequate flush on a regular basis. Um, and so we have utilized it in that way, even though there were previous recommendations. I think the previous recommendations were based on that it hadn't been, the pharmacokinetic or kinetic studies hadn't been done with that, but we've used it very successfully. Were either of the other two, have you have any comment on that? No experience, but I think it's um, logical and, and the reason why it's not in the, in the packaging so is of course a safety uh, for the manufacturer and not, uh, well, it has not been tested, but there's no reason why it should not be used in that way you mentioned. Yeah. There is also a comment that in tuberous sclerosis and Jeff Ravi syndrome, they recommend starting CBD before establishing drug resistance. I think the suggestion here is that, you know, should we wait for drug resistance to utilize it? Although actually most of the approvals are saying that at least two anti-epileptic drugs should have been used before um, utilization of it. And I suppose that is the definition of drug resistance, but um, yeah. Does anyone else have any comment? Uh, would, would agree to that. Yeah, yeah I agree. And uh, I think we do not have evidence of, uh, of uh, situations where it has been uh, tried uh, very, very early in the uh, process. There's a, there is a comment that, you know, as a researcher of CBD and epilepsy, criticism has been raised about additives in Epidiolex compared to un other unapproved products. And I think this relates to the fact that there is concern that it's not the full product. And therefore, do you need the full product to have the same benefit? And I think you have to look at it two ways. One, how do you know what the active product is? And if there's any adverse effect, what, how do you know what's causing the adverse effect? So we don't have evidence that anything more than that is required at the present time, but acknowledge maybe that is an area of research as we move forward. And also that we have to know the content of uh, what yes. we are giving the patients. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, I'm just going back through the questions. There is a question, is there effectiveness for children with refractory other, in other types of epilepsy syndrome? I think the issue is, is that we have randomized controlled trials in epilepsies related to three different syndromes, but actually that's proving in those are syndromes. It doesn't mean to say it's not effective in other types of epilepsy. We haven't got any evidence that 
it's a very specific mechanism in those three types of epilepsy. The problem is regulatory approval and what we could utilize it for. I think many of us would, I mean, I've used it on a compassionate use in a wider range of epilepsies and shown benefits. So no, it's not isolated, these three types. I'm sure it's regulatory and restricted, those three types of epilepsy. Um, okay, I think we've answered most of these, hang on. Somebody has asked that my statement about there's no evidence about THC is unclear. I think what I say about that is that we don't have answers as to whether THC confers greater anti-epileptic effect or not. And we don't have data as to whether what quantity and what is safe to administer either in the short or longer term. We don't know, and that's where we lack the evidence. Eugen, a question for you, and then maybe I'll come to it. What are the three most important clinical considerations for a neurologist starting a new patient on it with epilepsy on cannabidiol? Number one, the epilepsy syndrome. Number two, the drug resistance. And number three, the personal flavor. So uh, you see the, the lennox Casto or adult lennox Casto syndrome, they have not only this terrible seizure type, they change over time. Uh, in the foreground are behavioral problems in many cases. Uh, and uh, I think these are patients where I prefer to, uh, uh, to start with, um, with cannabidiol. Um, but uh, that's something which is a personal decision. Um, in many instances, the caregivers of the, the, uh, the people dealing with these patients uh, report an improvement, which cannot be easily quantified. And I think that's one of the phenomena of the drug. It's not the simple seizure count. And in these patients, seizure counts are anyway, uh, most of the time wrong and misleading. So it's the overall impression. But these are the three most important factors, I would say. Cecily, there's a comment here about um, pharmacokinetics. Um, we've talked about a fat-rich meal, and I apologize if you've said this before, but is there any other recommendation to improve the low bioavailability, for example, changing the route of administration, liquid capsules instead of an oil? Do we have any evidence for that? Yeah, well, we haven't talked about it in detail because um, we have no... Uh, Evidence. We have no clear evidence of, uh, of exactly what kind of food you should eat or how much. Uh, we just have uh, the phase one study with uh, a very uh, heavy fat-rich meal of about 1,000 uh, kilocalories. So it will not be a meal for uh, most of us. Uh, and, and then they showed four to five-fold increase in bioavailability. And who knows? If you eat half of this or uh, or uh, one uh, quarter, how much uh, will the absorption increase? We don't know yet. And uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, Epidiolex is only in the oily formulation. I think they are working on making uh, capsules like for um, uh, other fatty acid uh, supplements, but so far it's not available and we don't have any uh, better formulations, but this is, uh, of course, highly appreciated um, to develop something better. There was a question about half-life, um, and you may have answered this in writing, Loigan, but I just, you know, the issue is, is uh, knowing the half-life, do we know it's best to give it twice a day rather than once a day? No, uh, but we do that sometimes with other medicines too. Yes. which we could give once daily, we give it uh, twice daily. So the difference between once daily, twice daily is very important when we talk about monotherapy. When we talk about polypharmacy where multiple doses are taken anyway, the adherence is not improved by having once or twice uh, daily medications. It's more the pharmacokinetic aspect to avoid a peak of dose effect when you have uh, one big dose as compared to two medium-sized doses, right? So perhaps you lower the burden of adverse effects if you uh, divide it into two doses. So, yeah. uh, and this is uh, uh, the regimen that has been 
used in all clinical studies. Yeah, yeah. It also helps compliance, I think, doesn't it? <laughs> and there, there is a comment here about what is the efficacy in post-surgical failure patients. I don't think we have any reason to believe it should be any different to um, those in um, uh, refractory patients. Otherwise, we haven't got data. This would be focal onset seizures. And of course, we don't have regulatory approval for that. And we don't have specific data. Um, I think there was some data in focal onset seizures, which didn't prove very beneficial. Are you, going to, are you aware of that? Uh, there are some studies with focal onset seizures and there's Studies are of poor quality. They are not the licensing studies. Uh, some of them in temporal lobe epilepsy report an enormous efficacy and the others could not replicate it. So we don't know. Yeah, okay, thank you. Well, I think actually we have answered most of the other questions. So I'd like to thank um, particularly um, my co-panelists, Eugen Trinker and Cecily Johansson Landmark for joining me today. Um, I think this has been a highly informative and, and discussive topic, always a hot topic to discuss. Um, I thank you, all of the participants for putting forward such amazing questions, um, really um, participated in um, uh, driving the discussion forward. We will be asking you to complete a short survey that will pop up when you leave the e-forum We'd be really grateful if you could complete that so that we know which directions to go in the future and whether you've enjoyed this. Tomorrow, you will receive an email with details on how to access a self-paced virtual case to consolidate your learnings. If you keep an eye on the ILE's social media pages and our website, you'll learn about other educational events and activities that we offer from the ILAE, including our next e-forum. This e-forum will be available on demand from tomorrow anybody who wants to access it once again. Thank you very much to you all. Bye bye. Thank you, bye bye.